Welcome back. In today's video, we're overclocking the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X. That is a 64 core processor, all the way up to 4,500 megahertz. We do this using EK Quantum custom loop water cooling and the Asus ROG Zenith 2 Extreme motherboard. Originally, I had planned to just look at overclocking the Threadripper CPU, but during the course of making this video, I also made a small detour and had a closer look at the Zen 2 architecture, as well as made a brief overview of the AMD Ryzen overclocking technologies. There's a lot of unusual challenges related to Threadripper overclocking, and I found it particularly interesting to go through each of them. So for example, I spent several weeks trying to figure out what's the best manual overclock for this uh, Threadripper CPU. Anyway, I had a lot of fun making this video and I hope you enjoy watching it. The AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X is pretty much AMD's most maxed out Ryzen processor. It has 64 cores and 128 threads featuring the Zen 2 architecture. It has a listed base frequency of 2.9 gigahertz and a maximum turbo frequency of 4.3 gigahertz. It also has a TDP of 280 watts. The 3990X is part of the Threadripper 3000 product family. It is targeted at the high-end desktop market and falls in between consumer, prosumer, and enterprise segments. It was announced in November 2019 and eventually launched in February 2020, so more than two years ago. In this video, we will cover three overclocking strategies. First, we enable Precision Boost Overdrive and enable DOCP. Second, we tune the Precision Boost Overdrive parameters. Third, we go for a couple of manual overclocks. However, before we jump into the overclocking, let's first have a look at the hardware and the benchmarks that we'll be using in this guide. Along with the AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3990X processor and Asus ROG Zenit 2 Extreme motherboard, in this guide, we will be using two pairs of G-Skill Trident Z DDR4-4266 memory, a 512 gigabyte Kingston KC400 SSD now SSD, an Enermax Max Revo 1500 watt power supply, the Elmore Labs Easy Fan controller, the Elmore Labs power measurement device, the Elmore Labs EVC2, the EK Quantum Magnitude water block, and EK Quantum water cooling. All this is mounted on top of our favorite open bench table V2. The cost of the components should be around $6,870. I think it's the first time that I had to break out my NRMAX 1500 watt power supply in a Scatterbencher video. And that's of course because the AMD Ryzen Threadripper uses a lot of power. During my initial testing, I figured out that my usual 850 watt power supply wasn't able to supply sufficient current on the 12 volt lines, even for a Prime95 result when we're just enabling Precision Boost Overdrive. Therefore, I switched to my old but trusty Enermax 1500 watt power supply, which offers up to 30 amps on four of the 12 volt rails and up to 125 amps for all 12 volt rails combined. This was sufficient to power the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X fully overclocked. Do note that I didn't even use a high-end graphics card. Had I used my RTX 2080 Ti as well, I'm not sure one power supply would have been enough. I explained how I used the Elmo Labs products in Scatterbencher 34. By connecting the EFC and PMD to the EVC2 device, I can monitor the ambient temperature, water temperature, fan duty cycle, and CPU input power. I include the measurements in my Prime95 stability test results. I also use the Elmo Labs EFC to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. Without going into too many details, I've attached an external temperature sensor from the water in the loop to the EFC. Then I use the low high settings to map the fan curve from 25 to 40 degrees water temperature. This is used for all overclocking strategies. Later in this video, you'll find out that my Elmo Labs products were particularly handy for this platform. We use Windows 11 Enterprise and the following benchmark applications to measure performance and ensure system stability. This is the first time that I use the Enterprise version of Windows 11 in a Scatterbencher video. The reason why I use Windows 11 Enterprise is explained in an Antex review of the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X. In short, whenever Windows experiences more than 64 threads in a system, 
it separates those threads into processor groups. This means that if a multi-threaded program isn't built with processor groups in mind, then it might only spawn with access to 64 threads. Windows Enterprise is built with multiple processor groups in mind, and that has several benefits. As Anantec saw significant differences between the Enterprise and the regular version of Windows 10, we also decided to go with the Enterprise version, but of Windows 11. Personally, I really like the AI benchmark. It's a TensorFlow benchmark, so it's quite relevant to the new technologies. And it also seems to be able to catch out certain instabilities during transient loads better than other benchmarks. However, there are some key aspects of the benchmark that we need to mention. First, the Windows version of the benchmark uses Intel's Math Kernel Libraries, or MKL. Unfortunately, MKL for Windows does not play very well with multiple threads, and as a result, any Windows results are going to perform a lot worse than Linux results. On top of that, after a given number of threads, about 16, MKL kind of gives up and the performance drops quite substantially. That's why you'll see the overall benchmark performance of the Threadripper 3990X with its 128 threads being not much better than the results I got when overclocking the Alder Lake 12900KF processor with a mere 24 threads. Second, the MKL compute performance with AMD processors is notably worse than on Intel processors. The long story short is that MKL is developed by Intel and does not select the optimal code path for AMD processors. Specifically, by default, MKL looks for genuine Intel in the CPU string. And if it doesn't find that, it drops to a code path only optimized to the SSE2 instruction level. That means no modern hardware optimizations like AVX2. However, using an environment variable, you can force MKL to take the Haswell Broadwell code path, which gives an optimization level that includes AVX2. At least that worked for a while. Since the MKL 2020 update one, you can no longer force AVX2 support on Ryzen. While researching ways to improve performance, I did come across a Stack Overflow post stating that Ryzen support is embedded in the new Intel One API. You can enable One API Deep Neural Network Library, One DNN, using a simple environment variable. I used this variable in my Alder Lake overclocking guides, and just like on Alder Lake, this boosted the performance of the Ryzen Threadripper significantly. As I'm using the benchmarks primarily to check the performance scaling when overclocking, I didn't really bother looking too much more deeply into how to further optimize the TensorFlow performance on Threadripper CPUs. The first thing we need to do before we do any overclocking is check the system performance at default settings. Please note though that the ASUS ROG Zenith 2 Extreme motherboard enables Precision Boost Overdrive by default. So if you want to check the performance at default settings, you first have to go into the BIOS and go to the AI Tweaker menu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to disabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. Here's the benchmark performance at stock. Here's the 3 d Mark CPU profile benchmark performance at stock. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX enabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2,444 MHz with 0.775 volts. The average CPU temperature is 54 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 22.5 and 34 degrees Celsius. The average CPU package power is 233.9 watts. When running Prime95 small FFTs with AVX disabled, the average CPU effective clock is 2,909 MHz with 0.857 volts. The average CPU temperature is 55.2 degrees Celsius. The ambient and water temperature is 22.5 and 34.3 degrees Celsius. And the average CPU package power is 252 watts. Going forward, I won't be stating the Prime95 results explicitly, but provide you a simple table that will highlight the differences. Also, from a performance tuning perspective, it makes sense to check whether the benchmark applications improve in performance when we disable SMT. You know, as we discussed before, Windows may not be able to handle the 128 available threads that well. Go to the AI Tweaker menu. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Disabled. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. 
set SMT mode to disabled, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. The benchmark performance is all over the place. We can see clear performance improvements in specific multi-threaded benchmarks such as Geekbench 5, V-Ray 5, AI Benchmark, Y-Cruncher, Blender and 3DMark CPU profile. However, we also see cases where the performance is reduced significantly, for example in Cinebench R23 and CPU-Z. When comparing the Prime95 results, we find that in both AVX and non-AVX workload scenarios, disabling SMT provides additional performance headroom. The Precision Boost algorithm boosts the frequency 240 MHz in an AVX and 150 MHz higher in a non-AVX all-core multi-threaded workload. We also notice that the limiting factor for higher frequency is not the TDP, as in all our stability tests, the maximum PPT remains well below the limit of 280 watts. The limiting factor in all our tests is the TDC, which maxes out at 215 amps. In the non-AVX workload, we have an additional limiting factor as the EDC also maxes out at 300 amps. Now let us try our first overclocking strategy. However, before we do so, make sure to locate the three following buttons. Save boot button, retry button, and clear CMOS button. The save boot button temporarily applies save settings to the BIOS while retaining the overclocked settings, allowing you to modify the settings which caused a boot failure. The retry button forces the system to reboot in case it locks up during the boot process where the reset button is rendered useless. It will not change anything to your BIOS settings. Pressing the clear CMOS button will reset all your BIOS settings to default. This is useful in case you want to start your BIOS configuration from scratch. In our first overclocking strategy, we simply take advantage of enabling PBO and DOCP. PBO stands for Precision Boost Overdrive and is simply put, the overclocker's extension of the Precision Boost algorithm embedded in all AMD Ryzen CPUs. Since the launch of the very first AMD Ryzen CPU in March 2017, AMD has provided end users with quite a lot of performance tuning knobs. There's three main ones. The first one is XFR, which stands for Extended Frequency Range. The second one is PB, which stands for Precision Boost. And the third one is PBO, which stands for Precision Boost Overdrive. Let's take a trip down memory lane. The very first AMD Zen CPUs came with two performance technologies, Precision Boost and Extended Frequency Range. Precision Boost is an evolution of AMD's Core Performance Boost technology, or CPB, which came to market in 2010 with the Phenom 2X6 product line. Precision Boost uses a proprietary algorithm with inputs from a plethora of sensors inside the CPU to determine the optimal frequency and voltage at any given time. Precision Boost allows the CPU to opportunistically increase its clock frequency over the base frequency when conditions allow. To estimate the available headroom, the Ryzen CPU relies on the Sense MI technology suite. Inside the Ryzen CPU, there is a large number of sensors that allow the pure power technology to make adaptive adjustments to optimize power usage without negatively affecting performance. Precision Boost leverages the Pure Power Sensor Network to boost performance. The original implementation of Precision Boost is very similar to the 2010 implementation of Core Performance Boost as it provides a pretty rough boost mechanism. For Ryzen CPUs, there are only two boost scenarios, two core and all core boost. The Ryzen Threadripper CPUs also have two boost cases, four core and all core boost. A crucial competitive advantage of the Precision Boost implementation is that the frequency can be increased in steps of 25 MHz as opposed to the traditional 100 MHz. In theory, this should allow for boosting in more scenarios and thus enable higher average performance. Extended frequency range is also a pillar of the Sense MI technology suite. XFR is designed to reward customers who pair the CPU with enthusiast-grade cooling and allows the CPU to boost beyond the precision boost maximum boost if conditions are right. The extended frequency range is available only for up to two cores on Ryzen 1000 CPUs and up to four cores on Ryzen Threadripper 1000 CPUs. 
Contrary to popular belief, XFR is available on all Ryzen 1000 series processors. However, SKUs with the X mark would boost up to an additional 100 MHz, whereas non-X processors would only boost up to an extra 50 MHz. For Ryzen Threadripper CPUs, the extra boost goes up to 200 MHz. The Zen Plus processors came with an improved precision boost and XFR technology, as well as the overclockers extension called Precision Boost Overdrive. Precision Boost 2 is an evolution of the original Precision Boost technology. The principle of providing the user with more performance through frequency boost still applies. However, instead of evaluating the available headroom based on active cores, Precision Boost 2 algorithm evaluates the headroom based on CPU temperature, current, and power. The crucial advantage of this new algorithm is that Precision Boost retires the two scenario boost cases, two core versus all core for Ryzen desktop, and allows for frequency boosting of any number of active cores. The largest improvement can be seen in workloads with three or four active cores, and AMD claimed they observed frequency improvements of up to 500 megahertz. Precision Boost Overdrive is the overclocker's extension of Precision Boost 2, as it provides us with tools to tweak the Precision Boost 2 algorithm and achieve higher frequencies. It is important to mention that using Precision Boost Overdrive is a form of overclocking and is therefore not covered by warranty. If you understand the profound difference in the boost approach of the Precision Boost 2 versus the original Precision Boost, you will also understand the opportunity that arises from it. Precision Boost Overdrive allows the end user to change the power, thermal, and current parameters to provide the Precision Boost 2 algorithm with even more headroom. Precision Boost Overdrive has three main tuning knobs. Package Power Tracking, or PPT, measured in watts, is the amount of power the processor can draw from the socket before the boost levels off. It is important to note that this measure includes the power from all parts of the CPU, including the cores, but also the memory controller, and if present, the integrated graphics. Electrical Design Current, or EDC, measured in amps, is the peak current that the motherboard VRM can supply under transient conditions. A higher specification and more expensive VRM will provide more headroom. Thermal Design Current, or TDC, measured in amps, is the current the VRM can supply for a sustained period. Essentially, the limiting factor for this will be the combination of the VRM components and the VRM thermal solution. We'll have a closer look at tuning those parameters later in this video. Extended Frequency Range 2 is an evolution of the XFR technology in line with Precision Boost 2. Whereas the original XFR only allowed for up to two cores on desktop and up to four cores on high-end desktop to boost beyond the Precision Boost Maximum Turbo, XFR 2 allows for any number of cores to boost higher than the Precision Boost limit as long as the CPU temperature is below 60 degrees Celsius. The Zen 2 processors came with a minor iteration of the Precision Boost algorithm, essentially just a little bit more frequency. However, the biggest change came with the Precision Boost Overdrive feature set. Precision Boost Overdrive Plus is an unofficial name I just came up with to highlight the difference with PBO. Whereas the original PBO only allowed for adjusting the power and current parameters of the Precision Boost 2 algorithm, PBO Plus also allows for automatic overclocking or AutoOC. AutoOC can most easily be explained as a user configurable version of XFR2. As you remember, XFR allowed the processor to boost higher than the maximum precision boost frequency if the CPU temperature was low enough. The maximum boost was 100 MHz for Ryzen processors and 200 MHz for Ryzen Threadripper processors. With Zen 2, XFR disappears and is replaced by AutoOC. The user can now manually configure the maximum overclock in steps of 25 MHz up to 200 MHz. It's important to note that setting 200 MHz simply lifts the maximum frequency ceiling, but does not guarantee a higher frequency. The effective boost frequency is still governed by the Precision Boost 2 algorithm. In addition to the boost override setting, PBO Plus also offers a setting called Scalar. The scalar is a single factor that, when increased, 
forces the precision boost to algorithm to pursue higher voltages more aggressively. As a consequence, the frequency would be higher too. With the launch of the Zen 3 processors, AMD still includes Precision Boost 2 and has expanded the Precision Boost Overdrive feature set, now calling it Precision Boost Overdrive 2. Precision Boost Overdrive 2 builds on the PBO implementation of Zen 2. In addition to the overclocking knobs from Zen Plus, PPT, TDC and EDC, and Zen 2, Boost Override and Scaler, Precision Boost Overdrive 2 introduces Curve Optimizer. Curve Optimizer allows end users to adjust the voltage frequency curve for each CPU core individually. You can offset the entire curve by up to 30 steps in either a positive or negative direction. Each step represents between 3 and 5 millivolt. So, quick math tells us we can increase or decrease the curve by up to 150 millivolt. Two key things happen when you adjust the voltage frequency curve with a negative point offset. First, you effectively tell the CPU that for a given frequency it needs less voltage. And, as a consequence, at a given voltage it can apply a higher frequency. So, when the Precision Boost 2 algorithm determines there's sufficient power and temperature headroom to use, let's say, 1.35 volt, with the curve optimizer, it will target a higher CPU frequency. Second, because you use less voltage at a given frequency, the CPU temperature will be lower. That extra thermal headroom will encourage the PBO algorithm to target higher voltages and frequencies. I explored the ins and outs of tuning with Precision Boost Overdrive 2 in my Scatterbencher video with the Ryzen 7 5700G. So if you want to learn more about the impact of each of these settings, I would suggest you to check out that video. Since the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X is a processor with Zen 2 cores, obviously we're only going to be able to use the technologies inside the Precision Boost Overdrive Plus technology. In this overclocking strategy, we're simply enabling PBO. In the next overclocking strategy, we're going to be tuning the parameters as well. By enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, we allow the motherboard to change the PBO parameters to values programmed to the BIOS. We find that the following values have changed. Increasing the PPT, TDC and EDC limits enables more frequency headroom in multi-threaded workloads that were previously limited by power or current. The CPU fit limit increases by changing the scalar and encourages the CPU to pursue higher voltages. The frequency limit can technically also be increased using a plus 200 MHz boost override, but this is not done with this particular BIOS. The THM temperature and VID voltage limits are hard-coded and cannot be manually increased. So we expect to see the biggest performance improvements when the most cores are active. Obviously, when we allow the precision boost algorithm to take advantage of more power and more current, we're also going to be seeing higher temperatures. And in a couple of minutes time, it'll become very evident why I use my Elmore Labs tools to analyze and evaluate a key challenge with my particular system. As I explained earlier in the video, I use the Elmore Labs EFC to map the radiator fan curve to the water temperature. And I use the most aggressive fan curve setting. The curve initiates the fan at 25 degrees Celsius and ramps up gradually to 100% fan speed at a water temperature of 40 degrees Celsius. With normal desktop CPUs, the CPU temperature reaches TJ Max well before my fans run at 100% due to the water temperature. However, with the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X, that's different. As you will see from the Prime 95 results, under a sustained multi-threaded workload with PBO enabled, the water temperature exceeds 40 degrees Celsius. That means even though my fans are spinning full blast, they're not able to cool down the radiator and water sufficiently. In other words, I am limited by my cooling solution. Taking a step back, there are multiple layers to our thermal challenge. How hot the chip gets, how fast the heat is transferred away from the chip, and how fast the heat is removed from the cooling system. Now we can evaluate our specific thermal issue. As we know the CPU dyes are not exceeding TJ Maxx, the heat removal is our issue. We can only fix our thermal challenge by either changing how hot the CPU gets by reducing the operating voltage or 
changing how fast we can remove the heat from the cooling solution by changing the radiator or fans, as unfortunately, we're already running at 100% fan speed. Going forward, this thermal challenge will definitely prevent us from maximizing the performance of this particular CPU. I did consider buying another radiator and attaching it to the system, but you know, maybe I'll do that when the Threadripper 5000 finally makes it to market. DOCP stands for Direct Overclock Profile. It's an ASUS technology that aims to replicate the Intel XMP functionality. XMP allows memory vendors such as G-Skill to program higher performance settings onto the memory sticks. If the motherboard supports XMP, then you can enable higher performance with a single BIOS setting. So it saves you from lots of manual configuration. When enabling DOCP on the Zenit 2 Extreme, we are informed that the best performance is achieved with memory clock and fabric clock running at the same frequency. We'll return to this later in this video. It also tells us that the maximum fabric clock is around 1800 MHz. While our memory kit is rated at DDR4 4266, I will run it at DDR4 3600 with the fabric clock in sync at 1800 MHz. Not only will this ensure we run at optimal performance, it also helps us avoid a minor issue with the Zenit 2 Extreme. On this motherboard, it is not possible to run higher than the 1.2 volt default DRAM voltage unless you enable LN2 mode. I won't dig into why that is, as this particular issue was resolved on the Zenit 2 Extreme Alpha motherboard anyway. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to DOCP standard. Set memory frequency to DDR4 3600 MHz. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to Enabled. Leave the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set DRAM AB voltage to 1.2. Set DRAM CD voltage to 1.2. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation with both SMT enabled and disabled. By simply enabling Precision Boost Overdrive, we get significant performance gains in the multi-threaded benchmark applications. In tests that use only a few cores, we see a little bit of improvement thanks to the increased DRAM and fabric clock frequency. We see the highest performance increase in AI benchmark with plus 43.74% over stock performance. Looking at the Prime95 performance, we can see that enabling Precision Boost Overdrive Plus offers substantial improvements in clock frequency in both AVX and non-AVX workloads. We gain up to 743 MHz in frequency. That's a huge performance uplift. In our second overclocking strategy, we will make use of the overclocking nubs provided in the Precision Boost Overdrive technology. As I explained earlier in this video, Zen 2 processors come with the Precision Boost Overdrive Plus technology. Essentially, there are five tuning knobs that we can use to try and improve the system performance. PPT, EDC, TDC, Scalar, and Boost Override. Combined, these settings don't only allow for a higher frequency, but also higher frequencies for a longer period of time at a higher temperature and higher power consumption. Tuning these parameters is really simple. Generally, for scalar and boost override, I usually max out to 10x and plus 200 MHz immediately. For PPT, EDC, and TDC, you can refer to the values shown in hardware info for reference. For example, in the Prime95 non-AVX result from our previous strategy, we find that the maximum values for PPT, EDC, and TDC are 546 watt, 470 amps, and 395 amps. I use these values as a starting point to initiate the tuning process. For tuning itself, simply increase the limits in the BIOS, reboot, and open the same benchmark workload. Then check if the maximum values stay below our manually set limit. If they hit the limit, go back into the BIOS and further increase. Keep doing this until the maximum values stay below your configured limit. After tuning, I use the following PBO parameters. Upon entering the BIOS, Go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to DOCP standard. Set memory frequency to DDR4 3600 MHz. Enter the Precision Boost Overdrive submenu. Set Precision Boost Overdrive to manual. 
set PPT limit to 750, set TDC limit to 525, set EDC limit to 725, set precision boost overdrive scaler to manual, set customized precision boost overdrive scaler to 10x, set max CPU boost clock override to 200 MHz, leave the precision boost overdrive submenu, set DRAM AB voltage to 1.2, set DRAM CD voltage to 1.2, then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. After tuning the PBO parameters, we see a small bump in performance across the board, though not as much as we had hoped. This is reasonable for multi-threaded benchmark applications as most benchmarks don't require peak power and likely weren't limited by the default PBO settings. However, even in single-threaded applications, we don't see much performance improvements despite increasing the frequency ceiling by 200 MHz. This is likely because the algorithm simply doesn't boost higher. We can illustrate what's going on by having a look at what's happening to the PBO parameters in the various benchmarks. As you can see in the table, in only four benchmarks we hit any of the precision boost limitations. Increasing the PBO values could have an impact only on these benchmarks. Also note that in Geekbench 5, Cinebench R23 Single, AI Benchmark, Y-Cruncher and 3DMark CPU Profile, we hit the maximum frequency of about 4.3 GHz at the maximum VID of 1.5 volt. That means while we could increase the frequency ceiling by 200 MHz, there is little to no room for additional voltage to get to the higher frequency. Our only solution here would be Curve Optimizer, which unfortunately is only available on Zen 3. Let's have a look at the Geekbench 5 benchmark, which in our overview showed that it's hitting the EDC limit. I ran the Geekbench 5 benchmark a couple of times back to back, collected the information with hardware info, and then put it all in an Excel chart. I did this for three scenarios. PBO disabled, PBO enabled, and PBO tuned. Looking at the EDC results, we can see that PBO tuned enables a much higher peak current in the Geekbench 5 benchmark. About 27% of the benchmark time is spent at 655 amps or higher. With just PBO enabled, we hit the limit of 470 amps about 27% of the time. With PBO disabled, we spent 27% of the time around the limit of 300 amps. EDC represents the short-term current peak and as such, reflects mainly the short performance bursts. When we look at the PPT values, the result is much less obvious. While we spend more time at 550 watt or higher with our PBO tune settings, it's almost insignificant. Looking at the VID range, with our manually tuned PBL scalar parameter of 10x, we spend about 55% of the time above 1.4 volt. ASUS increases the scalar value to 7x when enabling PBO, and this puts it at about 49% of the time at 1.4 volt or above. With PBO disabled, we only spend about 10% of the benchmark time at 1.4 volt or above. Looking at the effect the EDC, PPT, and VID have on the effective clock, we find that while PBO tuned helps us achieve higher peak effective clocks, our peak effective clocks when all cores are active is lower. So overall, PBO tuned should still yield slightly better performance, but we can see from our test data that the impact of tuning precision boost overdrive values is unlikely to yield substantial differences. Or put differently, ASUS's pre-programmed values in the BIOS will be more than sufficient for the majority of the use cases. It boils down to this, the tougher the workload, the more it makes sense to go into tuning the PBO parameters. In our toughest workload, Prime95, we should therefore see quite some improvements. Looking at the precision boost to frequency boost in a sustained multi-threaded workload, we find that by manually tuning the precision boost overdrive parameters, we get between 85 MHz and 165 MHz additional frequency. The precision boost parameters PPT, TDC, and EDC are not the limiting factor for frequency anymore, as in all scenarios we're seeing a CPU temperature close to or right on the TJ Max of 95 degrees Celsius and a water temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. It would certainly be interesting to see how a larger radiator or better fans would impact the maximum frequency. In our third overclocking strategy, we will pursue some manual overclocking. 
I wanted to illustrate that it's important to tune for your specific use case. So for the purpose of this video, I've prepared three manual overclocking strategies. Prime 95 AVX stable with SMT enabled, Prime 95 non-AVX stable with SMT enabled, and Prime 95 non-AVX stable with SMT disabled. Each of these three configurations will have a different BIOS configuration and will have different benchmark performance. I'll try to provide a good overview of both the BIOS settings and the performance. I'm not sure if it will be successful, so please bear with me. It's also important to note that AMD actually has two overclocking modes, PBO and OC mode. The first mode you already know is Precision Boost Overdrive. This mode allows the user to change a limited number of parameters that are included in the PB algorithm. However, it is still the AMD Precision Boost proprietary algorithm that will eventually determine the performance of the system. The second overclocking mode is called OC mode. OC mode disables all the limiters, voltage controllers, and most protections. A major downside of OC mode is that all the automatic overclocking features are disabled too. That means you lose the benefit of the high single-threaded frequencies that the Precision Boost algorithm offers. To better understand the performance tuning opportunities that are embedded in the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X CPU, let's have a closer look at its architecture. The Ryzen Threadripper 3990X is AMD's flagship product in the Castle Peak Zen 2 product lineup. It is the most powerful consumer desktop CPU you can buy today. It is derived from the Epic server line and has no less than nine chips on package eight CCDs and one single I.O. die. CCD stands for Core Chiplet Die and is just the die on the Ryzen CPU that has CPU cores. The Zen 2 CPU cores are packed together in what's called a CCX or Core Complex. A Zen 2 CCX consists of up to four individual cores, each with its L2 and L2 cache and a shared 16 megabyte of L3 cache. Two CCXs are packed together inside a CCD effectively packing together eight Zen 2 CPU cores in one die. The frequency of the CPU cores is driven by a 100 MHz reference clock input. Each CCX has its own PLL and thus can run an independent frequencies. The cores within a CCX share the same PLL, so they'll run at the same frequency. For the Ryzen Threadripper 3990X, that means we can set an independent frequency for each of the 16 CCXs. The voltage of the CPU cores is provided by the VDDCR CPU voltage rail. This voltage is shared across all the CCDs, so each CPU core will be provided with the same voltage. That said, AMD extensively uses integrated voltage regulators. The voltage regulators are ultra high efficiency digital low dropout or DLDO. Most of the power domains, including the CPU cores, caches, fabric, and so on, have their DLDOs, which can be controlled individually. However, for consumer desktop parts, these DLDOs are permanently bypassed. That means the regulators are disabled and the voltage regulation takes place on the motherboard via the VRM. Choosing the right manual voltage will always be a trade-off between increasing the overclocking headroom, having to deal with the increased thermal challenges, and also considering the CPU lifespan. It's with that last thought that we kick off what is probably either the most tedious or the most exciting part of Ryzen Threadripper overclocking, per CCX frequency tuning. In short, here are the challenges and the opportunities. We already know that the cooling solution will be a key limiting factor because even at 100% fan speed, we can't keep the water temperature below our maximum target of 40 degrees Celsius. As we're limited by the cooling solution, we will also be limited by maximum CPU voltage because power consumption increases exponentially with operating voltage and temperature scales somewhat linearly with power consumption. The AMD Ryzen Threadripper CPU offers only one VDDCR CPU voltage rail, which provides the core voltage for all eight CCDs. However, we can tune the CPU ratio for each of the 16 CCXs independently. All things summed up, we use the following process for manual tuning. For each of the three scenarios outlined earlier in the video, we select a target CPU VID and run our stability workload. 
If we find sufficient thermal headroom, we increase the VID. If we find the CPU overheating, we reduce the VID. Once we have found a CPU VID that we're comfortable with, we set all CCXs to a certain ratio and run the stability test. Our target is to achieve a stability of 30 minutes using Prime95. Using hardware info, we check if the average effective clock maximum and average are the same. If a core is unstable or drops out, the maximum effective clock will be higher than the average effective clock. Then we can use hardware info to check which cores are having issues. For the cores that have issues, you can reduce the ratio. For the cores that work fine, you can increase the ratio. I found it helpful to write out the core numbers and current ratio so I could find which CCXs to change quicker. In this table, you can find the CCXs, their cores and their ratio I used for each of the three manual overclocking scenarios. Just as a reminder, the values in this table are tuned for my specific system and a specific stability test. Your CPU may have wildly different values depending on the CPU sample, cooling and motherboard, and your chosen stability test. The Castle Peak package is divided into four equal quadrants. Each quadrant consists of two CCDs and two linked memory channels. So in total, Castle Peak processors offer up to eight channels of DDR4 memory, half of which are disabled on the overclockable Ryzen Threadripper non-pro processors. Even though that's half of what the Zen 2 Epic server processors offer, it's still double the channels compared to the desktop Zen 2 Ryzen CPUs. At this point, it's important to highlight the significant architectural changes between Zen 1 and Zen 2 processors. On Zen and Zen Plus processors, there are up to four CCDs on package. Each CCD contains alongside the CCXs, also one memory controller, four Infinity Fabric connections, and a bunch of other I.O. Each die has access to its own set of memory via the on-die memory controller. When a CPU core wants to access data stored in the memory connected to another die, it needs to go via the Infinity Fabric connections to access the memory controller on that die. This came with a significant performance penalty. As per AMD documentation, the memory access latency via an on-die memory controller would be 90 nanoseconds. In a worst case scenario, memory access latency from a different die would be as high as 234 nanoseconds. In memory latency sensitive workloads like gaming, this yields quite a performance impact. As a solution, AMD promoted a gaming mode, which would disable cores to prevent a CPU core from having to check other CCDs' memory controllers. On Zen 2 processors, there are up to nine chips on package, one I.O. die and up to eight CCDs. The CCD is vastly simplified as it now only contains the CCXs with the CP cores and an Infinity Fabric connection. All other I.O. connectivity, including the memory controllers, moved from the CCDs into the on-package 40 nanometer I.O. die. This ensures better overall latency for memory access but puts the onus on fast fabric clock to ensure high performance. When a CPU core needs to access data in the system memory, it connects via the Infinity Fabric to the I.O. die and then accesses the memory controller. While the minimum memory access latency increased from 90 nanoseconds to 94 nanoseconds, the worst case scenario decreased from 234 nanoseconds to 114 nanoseconds. On average, that's a substantial performance improvement. AMD officially supports up to DDR4-3200, but of course Ryzen CPUs can overclock the memory a little bit higher than that. But it's not as easy as it may sound. To make a long story short, there are three relevant frequencies when it comes to system memory overclocking. Imp clock or memory clock is the frequency of your DDR4 memory. U clock or memory controller clock is the frequency of the integrated memory controllers. If clock or fabric clock is the frequency of the infinity fabric. The memory and memory controller frequency is driven by the same 100 MHz reference clock also used for the CPU cores. The memory controller and memory frequency are tied together. You can run both at the same frequency or when memory gear down mode is enabled, run the memory controller at half the frequency of the system memory. The voltage of the memory is provided by two VDDIO MEMIS3 voltage rails. 
Each voltage rail powers the memory linked to a specific memory controller. The voltage for the memory controller and fabric is provided by the VDDCR SLC voltage rail. For our configuration, we maintain the XMP timings, but reduce the frequency from DDR4-4266 to DDR4-3600 and run the fabric clock in synchronous mode at 1.8 GHz. We also manually fix the DRAM voltage to 1.2 volt to address the aforementioned issue with the Zenit 2 Extreme motherboard. When the CPU wants to store data to or retrieve data from the system memory, it does this through the Infinity Fabric and the memory controllers, which are embedded on the I.O. chip. By default, the system memory, fabric, and memory controllers are running in synchronous mode. That means that they're running at the same frequency. When overclocking, we can choose to either continue to run synchronous mode or run asynchronous mode. Synchronous mode is relatively taxing for the CPU. So on most Ryzen CPUs, the system will automatically enable asynchronous mode beyond a certain memory frequency. In asynchronous mode, the memory controller will operate at half the frequency of the system memory, and the fabric clock will also run below system memory frequency. This will result in a performance penalty. The size of the performance penalty is application specific and also depends on the final memory frequency. A sufficiently high memory frequency can overcome the performance penalty from running in asynchronous mode. Because the memory overclocking capabilities of Ryzen Threadripper is fairly limited, not in the least because of the four memory controllers, we prefer to run in synchronous mode. The fabric clock frequency is driven by the same 100 MHz reference clock also used for the CPU cores. It can be clocked independently from the CPU cores, memory controller or memory frequency. The voltage for the fabric is provided by the VDDCR SOC voltage rail, which also powers the memory controllers. While there's only one incoming voltage rail to the IO die, remember that AMD uses DLDOs to internally create additional voltage rails. That's why you'll find options like the VDDG for the fabric PHY in the BIOS. Zen 2 processors can, generally speaking, run synchronous mode all the way up to DDR4-3600 and a fabric clock of 1.8 GHz. However, some CPUs are better than others. So for example, my CPU was able to run synchronous mode all the way up to a fabric clock of 1867 MHz. Anyway, now that we know the ins and outs of manually overclocking a Ryzen Threadripper CPU, let's jump into the BIOS. In the following BIOS configuration, I will show you the settings for the third manual overclocking strategy, which is the one where we try to get stability in Prime95 with SMT disabled and no AVX. Upon entering the BIOS, go to the AI Tweaker menu. Set AI Overclock Tuner to DOCP standard. Set memory frequency to DDR4 3600 MHz. Set F clock frequency to 1800 MHz. Enter the CPU core ratio per CCX submenu. Set core VID to 1.275. Set CCD0 CCX0 to 40.50. Set CCD0 CCX1 to 41.75. Set CCD1 CCX0 to 41.25. Set CCD1 CCX1 to 40. Set CCD2 CCX0 to 39.50. Set CCD2 CCX1 to 39.75. Set CCD3 CCX0 to 39.25. Set CCD3 CCX1 to 39.25. Set CCD4 CCX0 to 40.50. Set CCD4 CCX1 to 41.75. Set CCD5 CCX0 to 41. Set CCD5 CCX1 to 41.75. Set CCD6 CCX0 to 39.50. Set CCD6 CCX1 to 39.50. Set CCD7 CCX0 to 39.75. Set CCD7 CCX1 to 39.75. Leave the CPU core ratio per CCX submenu. Enter the external DG Plus power control submenu. Set CPU load line calibration to level 1. Leave the external DG Plus power control submenu. Set DRAM AB voltage to 
set DRAM CD voltage to 1.2. Go to the Advanced menu. Enter the CPU Configuration submenu. Set SMT mode to Disabled. Then save and exit the BIOS. We reran the benchmarks and checked the performance increase compared to the default operation. As we are used to with AMD Ryzen, manual overclocking has the major drawback of losing the single-threaded performance we get with Precision Boost 2. Whereas even at stock, the CPU cores can boost up to 4350 MHz, with our manual overclock we only reach a maximum of 4175 MHz. That translates into about 5% performance less in single-threaded applications. In multi-threaded applications, the story is quite different as we see performance increases of up to 47.38% in AI benchmark and generally much higher performance across the board. Looking at the Prime95 frequencies, in a sustained multi-threaded workload, we find that by manually tuning the CCXs, we improve the frequency between 42 and 175 MHz. Of course, the story of hitting the limitation of the cooling solution continues. In the most strenuous scenario of Prime95 with AVX and SMT enabled, we're seeing a CPU temperature close to or right on the TJ Maxx of 95 degrees Celsius and a water temperature exceeding 47 degrees Celsius, even with the voltage below 1 volt. All right, let's wrap this up. I've had my eye on overclocking a Ryzen Threadripper system for a while now. I kind of was waiting for Threadripper 5000 to come to market, but it looks like that one's either cancelled or extremely delayed. But I did have an opportunity to try out the 3990X, this extreme 64 core CPUs. Truth be told, I was not ready for the challenges that this system would throw at me. Even getting Precision Boost Overdrive to run properly with the right performance was kind of difficult. Just to give you a summary of the challenges that I faced, uh, the CPU socket is extremely sensitive, so if you don't have a perfect mount, you may be losing memory channels. I had to swap out my 850 watt power supply for a 1500 watt power supply because of the current and power requirements of the overclocked Ryzen Threadripper CPU. My 360 radiator and fan setup was unable to maintain the water temperature lower than 40 degrees, which is you know, the maximum temperature that I want, effectively bottlenecking the maximum overclocking capabilities. The system performance in benchmarks can vary greatly depending on whether the benchmark can scale all the way up to 128 threads or not. Additionally, you know, the benchmark performance also uh, relies on the number of cores it uses because the precision boost algorithm evaluates the frequency headroom based on the current power and, and temperature available. So if it only uses 32 cores, you'll boost to higher frequencies. At the same time where I feel like this is the most challenging system that I've ever overclocked, it was probably also one of the most interesting ones. Because oddly enough, Threadripper presents a great opportunity for performance tuners as it really rewards you when you thoroughly know the use case that you're tuning for. Understanding, truly understanding the workload that you want to optimize for provides you with more ways of fine tuning the performance. So for example, a workload like Geekbench 5, which has uh, both a multi-core and a single core aspect uh, to it will Probably there you'll have the best performance if you tune Precision Boost Overdrive. Another example is, for example, AI Benchmark, where there's not really a single threaded component to it. And here we saw the best performance with a manual overclock. So disregarding the single threaded boost, just going for the highest multi-core performance. Another example is the 3 d Mark CPU Profile Max Threads where you know it scales with a lot of threads but it's not that heavy so here performance with precision boost overdrive is actually quite good but then at the same time when i tried after my overclocking experience tried to tune for it very specifically then i found that manually tuning for the highest multi-threaded performance gave me a lot better results i ended up with 27,000 points in that benchmark so about 1,000 points higher the long story short is that 
specifically tuning for a workload is rewarding with Ryzen Threadripper. And I think it's reasonable to do something like that as the Ryzen Threadripper CPUs are geared towards uh, customers who will use it for a very specific use case. You're going to be using it either for rendering or for high performance compute or for design work, but not everything. And that's very different from regular Ryzen desktop CPUs, which are geared toward consumers who will do a little bit of everything. You know, there will be gamers who will they'll play the game, they'll do some office work, they'll do some streaming, they'll do some rendering of YouTube videos. Maybe once in a while they do some computationally heavy applications as well. So for Ryzen desktop, you need to ensure solid performance for a wide range of applications and tune for that. Whereas for Ryzen Threadripper, you can use or you can focus on the peak performance in a very specific application. As a final note, I would like to add that I think there's still some performance left in this chip. Uh, if I would swap out the uh, cooling solution with maybe a bigger radiator, I think I would be able to get even more performance. And that's of course because we're primarily limited by the, the water temperature that got up to 47 degrees Celsius. When it comes to single threaded performance, I don't think there's anything left in the tank because we're essentially limited by the maximum VID of 1.5 volt. In fact, the only savior for our single threaded performance would be Curve Optimizer, which is available on Zen 3 or Ryzen Threadripper 5000 series. Anyway, that's all for this video. I think if Ryzen Threadripper 5000 comes to market, I will revisit uh, Threadripper systems. Uh, until then, I don't think I will go through this process again, but I kind of look forward to the opportunity of Curve optimizing 64 cores. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters for the support. For those who want to have a closer look at my BIOS settings, I'll also put up a written version of this video on my blog. So you can browse through the settings and the, um, uh, the details of this, of this video. As per usual, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and see you next time.